Let us worship the Father, worship the Father, worship the Father of glory. Let us worship the Father, worship the Father, worship the Father of love. And we will glorify, will glorify the Lord. And we will glorify, will glorify the Lord. So sing your praise to the Father. Stand up, church. Praise to the Father of glory. We'll sing your praise to the Father. Praise to the Father. Praise to the Father of love. And we will glorify, will glorify the Lord. And we will glorify, will glorify the Lord. So lift your hands to the Father. Hands to the Father. Hands to the Father of glory. Lift your hands to the Father, hands to the Father, hands to the Father in love. And we will glorify, will glorify the Lord. And we will glorify, will glorify the Lord. So let us worship the Father, worship the Father, worship the Father of glory. Let us worship the Father, worship the Father, worship the Father in love. And we will glorify, will glorify the Lord. And we will glorify, will glorify the Lord. Are you happy to be here this morning? Amen. We're going to sing a song that you've heard a million times, but we're going to sing it a little different this morning. If you were at the last uh, dinner in Devo, uh, you heard this song sang, um, uh, We Praise Thee, O God. How many of you have ever heard that one? Right? I think you've heard it most of This morning, it'll be a little different. Uh, same words, but you'll get it. Okay? So remain standing. Um, let's praise God together. Okay? We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise Thee, O God, for the Spirit of life who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the God of all grace, who has bought us and sought us and guided our ways. Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Revive us again. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Revive us again. Now, won't that song revive you? Get you pumped up? Amen. You can be seated. Proverbs 1, 20, 20 through 33. Out in the open, wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice in the public square. On top of the wall, she cries out. At the city gate, she makes her speech. How long will you who are simple love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? Repent at my rebuke. Then I will pour out my thoughts to you. I will make known to you my teaching. 
but since you refuse to listen when I call, and no one pays attention when I stretch out my hand, since you disregard all my advice and do not accept my rebuke, I will turn and laugh when laughter strikes you. I will mock when calamity overtakes you, when calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distress and trouble overwhelm you. Then they will call to me, but I will not answer. They will look for me, but will not find me, since they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord. Since they would not accept my advice and spurn my rebuke, they will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes. For the waywardness of the simple will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear or harm, or fear of harm. One heart, one spirit, one voice to praise you. We are the body of Christ. One goal, one vision to see. the Lord Lord to to bind bind us together. together. God, we come to you this morning with uh, thanks of prayers of thanks and praise. We uh, we thank you that that there's no war in this country within the boundaries, and has 
hasn't been for over 100 years. We, we see the troubles around the world and we just give you thanks that it's kept from our borders. Uh, we also give thanks and praise to Jacob and his family for guiding us and teaching us. And uh, we thank you for the for the fresh air to breathe. In Jesus' name, amen. Take time to be holy, speak off with thy Lord. praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings, who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Sing it, church, oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, because he first loved me. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Sing it, church, oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Sing out, church, oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. 
because he first loved me. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Greg, and Kristen, and Robin, and Michaela, and Jonathan, and Tom, and Tri Valley Church, and those of you singing, and everybody online worshiping with us or seeing this recording later and declaring together, we love Jesus. Why? Because it's easy to love somebody who loves you first. Jesus loves you. If you don't know that today, you're hearing it now. If it's hard to believe, it's true. Jesus loves you. He loves us. He laid down his life, gave his life for us. That's a big deal. We gather around this table to remember Jesus and his great love for each of us, the sacrifice that he made for the forgiveness of sins so that we can live freely, so that we can be part of doing God's will, bringing forth God's kingdom. This table reminds us of the place that God has set for us. He calls us family. He gathers us together as his people. So many symbols across the table, the bread, the cup. We do this every week because we don't want to forget Jesus. Jesus said, I don't want you to forget me either. My love for you, your love for me, your love for one another. So now we're going to gather around the table. If you don't have one of these little uh, bread and juice combos, there's some back in the lobby, or Dan the Man Hill can come by and uh, give you one, just give him a little hand wave. But in a moment, we're going to open these up, and we're going to eat the bread, the body of Christ. We're going to drink the grape juice, the blood of Jesus, and we're going to commune in his name. Throughout this series, as we've been listening to wisdom from the book of James, we have noticed that whatever James says, it seems like Jesus said first. I have a buddy who likes to go sailing, and I told him, man, sailing sounds scary because uh, being out there in the open water, you got to make sure you know your bearings, you can't get stuck, that's really dangerous, it seems like. And he said, well, there's different kinds of sailing. The kind I, I do, I'm never out of sight distance from the land. I'm not like going across to discover new worlds or anything like that. I can always see the shore from where I'm at when I go sailing. And I said, oh, I thought of that as I was thinking about James and his relationship with Jesus. But what James is going to take us is never far from Jesus. And there's a lot of kind of one-to-one comparison. So this morning, as we get ready to hear some wisdom from James 3, we're going to listen to the words of Jesus from Luke chapter 6. And as we've been doing, I'm going to read this, and then I'm going to ask you to turn to somebody near you, or if you're at home, you can talk to somebody you're with, or type your response in the chat. We're going to ask the same questions we ask. What does this scripture tell us about God, and what does this tell us about people? Simple question. So listen to what Jesus has to say. In Luke chapter 6, this is verse 43 through 45 ish. Jesus tells us this No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. I'm going to read this one more time. And then I'm going to ask you to turn to somebody next to you and say, let's say, let's imagine we're hearing Jesus for the first time. Maybe we're one of his disciples, one of his followers in the first century. We've heard about Jesus. Maybe we know a thing or two. We hear him say this. What does this say about what God wants, who God is, and what does this tell us about how we're supposed to live according to Jesus? Who, by the way, we have heard in this hypothetical scenario, is the Son of God. I'll give you a little help there. Luke 6, starting in verse 43. Jesus says, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. 
People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So we remember Jesus. We hear his words and rededicate ourselves to being doers of these words and not just hearers. I want to invite you to take three, four, five minutes, just turn to the one or two people around you and respond to the question. What does this tell us about God, what God wants, and also what does this tell us about people and how we're supposed to live? Take some time, talk about that amongst yourselves. We get a shaky effect. You guys can, uh, you take about 20, 30 seconds to wrap up your conversations. I'll give you more chance to talk about this later. As some of you know, this is discussion part one. It's a little more broad. What, you know, what, are, what ought we generally to do 
And then after we hear some of the sermon, the sermon text, we're going to redirect it to, now what about, what about you? Where does this hit you? How are you convicted by these words? Um, I appreciate you guys interacting with this text, discussing it. There's something good about this way of doing communion where we're hearing the words of Jesus. Oh, what, is that, what does that mean? What does that mean for me? Uh, I appreciate you guys. I appreciate those of you online sharing answers and interacting with this text as well. This time I want to invite you to open up your communion cups, make your way to the, the bread. Jesus says, this is my body given for you, broken for you. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples. Do this in remembrance of me. We remember Jesus, his broken body, and that he called himself the bread of life. Let's eat this as we remember Jesus. And on the other side, we have sweet, delicious grape juice. This uh, is my blood shed on behalf of you. Uh, we drink this. We toast to King Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this meal. We thank you for giving your life. We thank you for the great love you've shown us on the cross and the great power you demonstrated in the empty tomb. That we are betting everything we have on the resurrection hope that we too will be raised if we are found in Christ. Lord, we gather here to worship you, to bring honor to your name, and to examine ourselves and say, in what ways are we like Jesus? In what ways are we more like the world? We want to be like uh, the good man who brings forth the good that is stored up in his heart, and not like the evil man who brings forth the evil that is stored up in his heart. We don't want to be a house divided. We want to be dedicated to you. So we give you our lives. We give you our hearts. We give you our plans and the weeks that we put in front of us. And we say, they are yours. Make them what you need them to be. Make us who you require us to be. We thank you for your love your grace, and your mercy. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> this time we're going to invite up Ryan and Sarah Gibson to share some announcements about what's going on here in the congregation, some upcoming events and uh, announcements. Ryan and Sarah are our children's ministry coordinators, so they do a lot for this church. They're very excellent people. Uh, but maybe let's clap for them in, as a way of showing appreciation for them. Well, yeah, you didn't think we clapped for you, but we did. Good morning, everyone. So uh, we just enjoyed communion together, and part of what goes along with that communion is that we are called to share some of those many blessings that we have been given with others. So this is the time when we're called to give back to the church, whether that is done online, whether that's done in person or through the mail. What you all share with the church is what helps to fund all the things that the church does, like keeping the lights on, paying for Jacob, as well as paying for the events that we have with the children's ministry and youth groups. So without all of your donations, none of that would happen. Uh, for any visitors or anyone who has prayer requests, there are cards underneath the seats in front of you that you can go ahead and fill out your information on them and then hand them to Jacob. If there are prayer requests, you can mark them as private if you want them kept private or if you are willing for them to be shared. They will be prayed about today at the end of service as well as they will be sent out in the newsletter that gets sent out. So we have a few upcoming events um, this month of October. So on the 25th, that's a Wednesday, we have dinner in Devo. And this month it is the chili cook-off. So if you are interested in bringing chili, you need to talk to Brittany. Um, and then we need people to bring sides as well, which you'll also talk to Brittany. And I think she said in a few weeks she'll have a sign-up. Next week there will be a sign-up, so you can sign up for what you want to bring. Um, on the 28th, which is a Saturday, we have a children's ministry and youth ministry Halloween-themed encounter night. 
Um, so from 6 to 7, it's for everyone, or 6 to 7.30, sorry. Um, it's for everyone. And then from 7.30 to 9, it is for the youth group to do some things that uh, maybe the younger kids are not as interested in. Um, for children's ministry, we are very thankful for all the people that have volunteered uh, to be teachers. Um, we are still looking for teachers for the nursery for the month of November. So if you're interested in teaching our littlest ones, um, we still need teachers for November. Okay, so going into Jacob's sermon, the way things have been going this time, we're going to invite you all to have like a two to three minute stretch break. And while you are all getting up and stretching, children, you are dismissed to go to class, so please don't knock anyone over on your way out. guys limber up, stretch. Everybody's feeling loose now. Good deal. We've been listening to the words of wisdom from James, the half-brother of Jesus, Jerusalem church leader from the earliest days of Christianity. You can read about James in Acts a little bit. Like we said last week, contemporary of uh, Paul and Peter and some of the Early Christians going, man, Jesus is Lord. He died. He was raised. He ascended to the right hand of God. He commissioned us to go make disciples, be the church, love one another. How do we do that? It's like a big, what does that look like? That's a whole main question of the New Testament. What does it mean to be the people of God in light of the resurrection of Jesus? And we're still figuring that out in some ways. But James is an excellent voice to listen to in this conversation. And like I said, he gives us wisdom that is never far from the shores of the teachings and the way of life commissioned by Jesus. There's something to be gained by listening to James. But as we know, we're not just supposed to listen to it. We're also supposed to do it. And that's why this series is called An Embodied Faith, living it out with our actions our way we live, the decisions that we make, and specifically, as we'll hear in the text we're looking at this morning, the way we talk, the things that you say. I forgot, I'm going to back up just a little bit. I forgot to share with you a piece of good news that I got this last week. I am the preaching minister here at this church, and I got, uh, I applied for a program for some training, some preaching training that uh, Pepperdine University is sponsoring. They just kind of put it out there to Church of Christ preachers. Hey, would you like to get some more, some training and mentoring in the discipline of preaching? And I said, sure, that sounds great. And they got a big grant to fund uh, almost 100% of it. And I found out this last week that I got accepted into a preaching training program. 
cool, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll give glory to God for, for that. That's, that's a pretty sweet freebie. So um, uh, starting in February, I get to go down for a conference, and then there's like check-in meetings throughout the 2024 calendar year. So yay, thank you, Pepperdine. And um, you'll have to let me know at the end of next year if my, my preaching sounds any more compelling. It's called the Compelling Preaching Initiative. I, I do like preaching. I, I like trying to take what we see, what we hear and hear, and then just kind of getting us going, launching us into a new week of being faithful followers of Jesus. And I have to say, one of my favorite preachers is James. And maybe you've noticed this as we've been studying through his book. It's a five-chapter, just short little New Testament letter that James wrote. It reads a lot like a sermon. He has a lot of preacher sensibilities. He likes to use stories. He likes to use illustrations. He'll just like say something, throw it out there like a hand grenade, and then walk away. All right, good luck. Deal with it. I love it. That's, that's what preachers like to do. The passage we're going to hear this morning, if you thought last week's passage had a lot of illustrations, this is another example of James basically saying just one thing, but illustrating it in multiple different ways. And what he's going to remind us is something he's already told us earlier in his, his letter, and that is you've got to be intentional with what you say. This section is called Taming the Tongue. You might remember from chapter 1, James says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. And part of doing that, he says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Nod your head if you remember that he said that. Now keep nodding your head if you've been doing that for the last three weeks. You've been slow to speak, quick to listen, good listeners. <clears throat> slow to become angry, maybe, sometimes, more than others, with some people, more than others. James doesn't just throw that hand grenade out there and walk away. He comes back to it. Like I said earlier, in every single chapter of James, in one way or another, he's going to remind those who follow Jesus to discipline your language, to bless and not curse. This way is the way of Jesus. This way is something else. Kind of like what Jesus told us. You know, the good person is going to bring good things because they have good in their heart. But the evil person with evil things in their heart, well, when they're squeezed, when they're pressed, it's going to come out evil stuff. This is not how we're supposed to live. Okay? Let's listen to what James has to say about this. I'm not going to put the text on the screen. Instead, I decided this week I would just put an icon that represents each of the different images that James goes through. And I don't even think I have them all up there. But these are some of the main ones that you'll hear. James says this, chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who's never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, James says, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Well, the tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the other parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and you think he's not been harsh enough yet, is itself set on fire by hell. Yikes. He's not messing around here. And he's not even halfway done. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Double yikes. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? No, neither 
Can a salt spring produce fresh water? It's one of those examples where this is not a hard concept to understand. Maybe the challenging part is in living it out. Maybe you have your own experience of a time where you went like, James is right. The tongue can be very dangerous weapon. It can be a poison that works its way through something much larger. It can be something that steers the whole course of a relationship or how you interact with somebody. When I was in college, a group of friends of mine, we all went out for ice cream. We were in Southern California, so we went to this place in West Hollywood. And we're waiting in line, this fancy ice cream shop, and we're just chatting and talking. And then the conversation starts to turn toward this television show that was, was on a few years previous. And they said, oh, yeah, that, that one girl, she was sisters with the girl. And I sort of tuned in on the conversation at that point, and I said, oh, yeah, I remember that show. One of the sisters was really good looking, and the other sister was kind of like weird looking. And I don't know why she was even on TV, because she was not a very attractive actress. I, I don't get why they made that casting decision. Firing off my tongue. Putting my two cents in. Turns out the reason that they were talking about that TV show is because the actress who played the not-so-good-looking sister was like two places in front of us in line. What? Oh, yeah, well, here's what I think about this. And they were embarrassed. I'm pretty sure the actress heard us. Thankfully, nobody punched me in the face that day, but that's probably what I deserved. You, I'm sure, have your own stories about a time when your tongue got away from you. Realized maybe I shouldn't have said that at all, but certainly didn't do me any favors. James begins this section by saying, not many of you should presume to be teachers. Not many of you should become teachers, because teachers are going to be more highly judged than not teachers. Not to go against anything, Ryan and Sarah will invite us, like, hey, we need more teachers in children's ministry. You're like, oh, I don't know, James says, I don't know. I don't necessarily think that's what he's talking about here. Maybe there was something going on in his context where teachers were not necessarily teaching the wrong thing, but the way they were teaching it was off-putting, or maybe kind of like my shooting off the mouth in the ice cream shop. It, just, it, doesn't, it doesn't really reflect God. This is not how we're supposed to live. There's something going on where James had to say, now listen, the way you guys are talking is not the way of Jesus. We've got to return to this. We've got to get this right. We hear a passage like this sometimes and go, oh, this is James talking to teachers, formal teachers, maybe like Bible teachers, preachers, the guys that Jacob will be in a cohort with in the Compelling Preaching Initiative. This isn't me. This is somebody else. This is, this is advice for them and not for me. I'm going to sit this one out. But maybe we already know that's not the most faithful way to interpret this passage. Kind of like when Jesus was teaching about the greatest commandments. We heard this last week. What are the greatest commandments? Well, you already know them. Love God. Second one, very similar, very much like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. But someone goes, well, who's my neighbor? As if that's not enough. Like, love, love the people around you. Love everybody, Jesus is saying. Yeah, well, who's my neighbor? I kind of want to love those people and make it easier on myself. Who knows? And then Jesus tells the story we heard last week. The Good Samaritan. There's somebody who is in need. Two religious people didn't help him, and then his sworn enemy comes by and helps him. Which one was a neighbor to the man who was in trouble? Well, the one who helped him. There you go, Jesus says. You have your answer. Go and do that. I think this, you could apply this here. Like, well, who's a teacher? Anybody who's trying to reflect Jesus. We're called to be disciples, and we're called to be salt and light, ambassadors of Christ in a world that may not know him. We have a responsibility be faithful, not just in what we're teaching about Jesus, but how we're saying it, how we're living our lives, making sure our tongue does not burn down a whole forest of relationships. You might have heard this illustration. Somebody said, uh, describing the effects of gossip. You find out somebody said something about somebody behind their back. This wise teacher said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a sack of feathers, and I want you to climb up this tall mountain, and I want you to scatter the feathers on your way. When you get to the top, Nice and windy, scatter some more feathers, and then come back down the mountain, scatter them again, and comes back to the third. Okay, I did that. Now what? He says, go put all the feathers back in your bag. Go and collect them. Well, that's kind of, if I can do it, seems impossible. That's the point. That's the impact that 
slandering somebody, gossiping about somebody. That's the impact it has. You can't unring that bell, the illustration goes. I'm kind of just adding on to what James has already said. He had lots and lots of examples about the harmful nature of what, how you can say can impact the people around you. I could give more examples. I could tell you about going to East Avenue Middle School this week. And it's a great experience. Curtis and I get to go and do these talks for all the middle schoolers there. In between classes, we get to high-five them and say, oh, you play the ukulele? That's amazing. Oh, you, you used to play rugby? Tell me about that. That's fantastic. We try to bless these students. We're trying to encourage them. They live in an environment where there's a lot of cursing, where it's a hard environment to be yourself. You want to think something, you got to check with the peers and make sure that it's all on the up and up. Third period, they do announcements before class starts each day, and every single day that we were there, I've been there, I don't know, maybe six, eight days so far. Every time we're there during third period, the principal comes on, talks about what's going on in the school. Every single day, she says, now I need to remind you, stop with the hate speech. Stop using racial slurs. Stop cussing at your teachers. Stop picking fights with each other. One day, she said, it's gotten better, it's less horrible, but we still have to work on it. And I went, wow, less horrible? <laughs> That's a pretty, pretty low scorecard. There's work to be done in the middle schools. This is a, an ongoing problem. You may have heard the story in the news about the Harvard students who signed a statement that said, hey, we support what Palestine is doing, and we have our reasons. We think Israel's misguided. They chose a side. And they're trying to get kicked out of the school. There's business leaders and board members on Harvard University that's trying to get them blackballed. Somebody published a statement that says, I hope those students don't get hired because of what they sided with, because of one thing that they said. Tiny spark. The whole thing is set on fire. And you might have your own opinions about what's going on in the Middle East. I'm sure you do. And I wonder, if we're being quick to listen and slow to speak, slow to become angry, being careful about what we say and how we say it, because this is what James is calling us to. He's pointing out the dangers. It's a, it's a deadly poison. It's a forest fire. It can destroy your life. It's, it's your life being set on fire by hell, is what James says. And again, I'm still talking about this. He said one thing, and then he said it again. 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 And I've got more illustrations. I could keep pounding away at this. But I don't think that's what we need. I don't think we need more convincing that the things we say can have devastating, harmful effects in the people in our lives. What I want to do instead is I kind of want to walk it back. I want to reverse it and get us to start dreaming as followers of Jesus about not the destructive power of the tongue, but what about the constructive power of the tongue? It's true. It is a powerful, powerful, small thing that can have a big impact. And James mostly spends his time talking about the negative side effects of that, which is a great warning, and I'm sure we need to hear that. But I want us to start dreaming about what it could do if we use that tongue for good, not for evil. What would it mean to have a widespread effect? The one little thing that you say could impact someone's life in a positive, amazing way. I came across this poem that you might have seen on the internet, it's called Pretty Ugly, and it reminded me of the people in our community, the middle schoolers. Claire, you can put this up on the screen. I'll read this here in just a moment. I'm thinking this is how some people, this is their starting point for their day. This is what they already think. This is the self-talk that they give themselves. I'm worthless. I don't matter. And then if we slander them, if we don't encourage them, if we use our tongue to, to beat them down, it's only going to be negative. It's only going to make things worse. Listen to this poem that somebody wrote. I'm very ugly, so don't try to convince me that I'm a very beautiful person, because at the end of the day, I hate myself in every single way. And I'm not going to lie to myself by saying there is beauty inside of me that matters, so rest assured, I will remind myself that I am a worthless, terrible person. Nothing you say will make me believe I still deserve love because no matter what, I am not good enough to be loved and I am in no position to believe that beauty does exist within me because whenever I look in the mirror, I always think 
Am I as ugly as people say? Now watch this. What if instead we turned it on its head? If we read this poem backwards, there's a different message that I think the Lord wants people to hear. Listen to it read from bottom to top. Am I as ugly as people say? Because whenever I look in the mirror, I always think beauty does exist within me. And I am in no position to believe I am not good enough to be loved. Because no matter what, I still deserve love. And nothing you say will make me believe that I am a worthless, terrible person. So rest assured, I will remind myself there is beauty inside of me that matters. And I'm not going to lie to myself by saying I hate myself in every single way because at the end of the day, I am a very beautiful person. So don't try to convince me that I'm very ugly. Is that cool? What would our church look like? What would East Avenue Middle School look like? What would your family, your household, the places you work, the places you go, the people you enter, what would that look like if we as kingdom people reverse the effect of what's already like running wild like wildfire? People cursing each other. People slandering each other. People <laughs> insulting each other in ice cream shops because they're careless and thoughtless. What if we walked that back and said, ah, instead, this is what God's people are called to do. What James says, to bless and not curse. Can salt water and fresh water come from the same spring? It shouldn't. Can the people who praise God and like declare our, our freedom in Christ, oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. Can we then go out and slander our neighbor or make people who already feel beaten down feel worse? Or is it our job to bless? And to remind, yeah, <laughs> thanks, Dan. To remind ourselves of what God says about his creation. You are my children. You are my beloved. You are worth going to the cross and laying down my life for. Whether you know me yet or not, whether you know that I, I created this world and I created you and I know every hair on your head, it's our job to reflect that message to people and say, oh, you are so loved. You are so lovable. What would it look like? If we took this power, if we harnessed this power of the tongue, this explosive, this very, very, what he calls dangerous power of the tongue, and we used it for good in the name of Jesus. Man, that would transform so much. That's what I want to call us to do. That's what I want to remind us about this morning. So, I brought back these communion trays. You guys remember these? We used to pass around the grape juice in our gold, ooh, fancy communion trays. Um, but instead of grape juice, we already, we already drank the juice. I've got beads. There's little uh, plastic pony beads in here. I'll show you. I'm going to pass these around. It's just a little cup of beads. There's anywhere between like five and ten beads. And I'm going to pass these around, and you each get one. Don't drink them. That won't end well. I want you to take them, and I want you to put them in your pocket. This is a, this is a trick somebody taught me once. Got five or six in there. Put them in your pocket. For the rest of the day, I want you to be intentional about blessing somebody. Say, Rick, I'm always glad when you're here. I love the way you worship God. You're such an encourager. Uh, if, if anything, I, I want to spend more time with you. I want to bless Rick and say something true. And then I take this bead. I don't need this cup anymore. Put it in the other pocket. You just transfer from one side to the other. And you make a commitment every single day to try to get all of your beads from one pocket to the other pocket. Does that make sense? This is a reminder for us to be those who bless and not curse. And along the way, if you can eliminate some of the stuff that we do, we're like, ah, I shouldn't be talking like that. Th that's good. But I want us to get in the habit of reminding ourselves that this is what we're called to do, to bless, to love, to honor people with what we say, with our words, and not tear them down. So yeah, go ahead and pass those around. Everybody get one. Put them in your pocket. If you don't have a pocket, 
There's no rule against fanny packs. Uh, I don't know. Hold them in your hand. Get some pockets. <laughs> but here, I, I mean, I want you to do this today, and then I want you to do the same thing tomorrow. Transfer them from one side to the next. Some, somebody I know does this with pennies. You lose your beads. You can do them in your back pocket, and then if you ever sit down on them, with all these beads in my pocket. Oh, that's right. I gotta bless somebody. I've only got one transferred over. And if six or ten times a day is not enough, if you keep running into people and want to keep blessing, then just transfer to the other pocket. Keep going. But this is our challenge. This is what I want to call you guys to do intentionally this week. So as you're getting your beads, put those in your pocket. Be thinking about somebody in your life who could use this blessing. And then maybe the flip side of that coin is somebody that you are most likely to lose your patience with or to slander or to talk about when they're not there in maybe a negative way. Just let this message convict you and say, ah, yeah, I struggle with that person, but I'm going to be really intentional. And maybe I've reached the end of my ability to love certain people or to find good in people that just drive me crazy. That's where we say, you know what, this isn't just try harder, do better, be a better person, because that's self-help. We have help that goes beyond ourselves. This comes from God's Spirit at work in our world, so I want to call you to pray about this. Identify a, a challenging person in your life and just call God to say, give me peace with them. Give me more strength to love them. Remind me throughout my day to move these beads from one side to the next. And yeah, honestly, Remind me next week, if I don't ask you how it went, if I don't ask you to show me your beads next Sunday, like, remind me to do that. Because I think what we'll come back here with are some amazing stories, just some awesome testimonies about how God has been changing our hearts and using us to bless the people around us. And I think, like, the big ship that maybe steered this direction or that wild horse that's hard to tame, we take this, this small effort, and I think it's the kind of thing that can really change the world. So, that's enough from me. I told you I was going to give you another chance to turn and talk to the people around you, and I want you to do that. Uh, maybe, if you're willing, share that one person that you identified that you need more strength from the Lord to love. Um, but just pray together. Turn to the people around you and pray for this to be something that actually happens. And also during this time, if there's something that you need, a need that you have in your life, or somebody you know who's on our prayer list. We've got, we get several prayer requests from people. We'll send those out in the email um, Monday morning. So be praying for those folks. But, I mean, use this time right now in prayer to say, hey, there's some people that we need to be lifting up. And we're going to use this as a time to pray with one another and for one another. So hopefully that makes sense. For the rest of our time together, you know, for the next five or ten minutes, turn to the people around you, talk about how this message convicts you, and pray for each other. Ready, set, go.